Hey guys, welcome to Thrive Bites, the official podcast of Dr. Colin Zhu, aka The Chef Doc. On every episode, I talk with health and wellness experts from all over the world, such as doctors, chefs, dietitians, coaches, and many more. And I sit down with them and have casual conversations about plant-based lifestyle, how to elevate our emotional resilience, and what it really means to thrive. And I bring all of this to you. So let's get to this week's episode. Anyway, we will get started as uh, listeners join in. I see uh, Lisa just joined in. Hello, Lisa. Um, And uh, all right, cool. So uh, guys, thank you so much for joining in. This is the COVID series, Staying Well Amongst COVID, um, the new on-air live series, part of Fry Bites. I'm your host, Colin Zhu. And uh, this today we have a very special guest. Her name is Dr. Ragini Mirala. Say hi to everyone, Ragini. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, so I'm so excited for her to be on the show. Um, I know you and I have connected before and we were planning on I'm getting connected for a conference later this year, but I know it needed to be postponed and uh, very excited. That was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. I was really excited, looking forward to it. And uh, how many people were you, uh, I guess, collectively uh, having? Yeah, we were going to have an amazing speaker panel come out to New York City about nine to 12 speakers, hoping for 100 Uh, guests for a continuing medical education conference out there in New York. And it was heartbreaking to have to cancel that for now and postpone it indefinitely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm sure it will happen real soon. And, uh, you know, we're all collectively, we're all, you know, wanting to, you know, look forward to uh, getting back to our normal routine. So, but uh, I think uh, it's good to kind of question what is normal, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, we were certainly excited to have you there. And uh, I, I really am optimistic that we'll, ha- we'll get to reschedule at some point after all this is over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely looking forward when it does uh, happen. So, um, so for those who are new um, to the show and new to you, uh, please introduce yourself, uh, where you're calling from and, uh, you know, what is happening on your side of the world <laughs> in regards with all this? Sure. Well, I'm a pediatrician and I am living in T- Houston, Texas and I know that our state hasn't been as affected as some of the other states, but certainly the numbers here are growing. My husband is an ER physician, and I'm a hospitalist as well as the owner of an urgent care. So we are very much on the front lines, and we've had to go through numerous iterations of protocols and go through all of that Uh, angst about getting enough PPE, that's uh, protection equipment for staff. We've gone through lots of changes in our daily routine, both at home and at work. So, um, but, you know, I think people are definitely listening uh, and staying home and keeping us safe. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's a very interesting time. I've been seeing that a lot. Um, you know, we've had a lot of uh, we focused a lot. So the purpose of this is, um, you know, I'm the regular host for Thrive Bites, and I decided to start this, you know, series because, you know, initially when the pandemic hit, um, you know, pretty much as we all know, mass chaos ensued, and you know, a lot of heightened fears, anxiety, um, stress, things like that. And I wanted to create a series you know, to be able to, how to maintain our wellness throughout this time period, right? Um, For us, uh, especially latter generations, you know, we haven't experienced anything like this that disrupted our lifestyle, um, you know, and our times, you know, I'm sure war vets would have something similar where things had to halt and, you know, a lot of their daily lives had to come to a, a grinding stop. So they're more used to it, you know, 
But I wanted to kind of uh, also give you know physicians a platform um, because I feel like mainstream media, um, you know, doctors don't really get a chance to voice themselves. And you know, before we go into our main topics, I kind of want you, um, Ragini, to kind of um, talk about because you're you know on the front lines. You and the husband um, are, and uh, you know, we do hear a lot about. Uh, supplies not being enough, uh, um, you know, masks especially, PPEs, which stands for personal protective equipment. And um, I guess I, I want to give an opportunity, you know, for you um, speaking on behalf, you know, people on the front lines, you know, it, what is it that you would like, you know, the public or non-healthcare related people to know um, different that is not, you know, really spoken you know in the mainstream media right now sure so the things that you may not see when you're not in healthcare are the numerous amounts of meetings that are happening amongst administration and doctors and nurses to create protocols which are both socially responsible in terms of how much, how many resources can we possibly provide in terms of tests for our patients and yet have, um, and still contain cost and contain resources so that everyone can have enough to go around and so that we can um, use it where it's, necessary and not use it where it's not necessary. So for example, at my hospital now, um, we, all the physicians have to go through one entrance and we are given one mask uh, per day, which we have to reuse. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so we, we walk in through this entrance, someone takes our temperature and hands us a mask and puts a little sticker on our badge that we have been screened for that day. Mm -hmm. And these masks, you know, they, um, they get gross <laughs> and uh, they're uncomfortable. And, you know, uh, patient after patient, you feel a little bit suffocated. Uh, it, my husband had to um, sew up a, a large laceration and he's wearing this mask and he, goes outside after a while and, and says, wow, I am really feeling a little bit dizzy um, having, you know, because, uh, and then the, and the patient says, are, are you okay? Uh, is it you, that you can't stand the sight of the blood? And he says, no, it's that I have to breathe in this mask. <laughs> so um, those are the kinds of little stories that people don't see um, but that, but they're the real, they're the real life. And, you know, the, each patient, uh, that comes in through the emergency room, we have to ask a specific set of questions. We have to ask uh, a thing, where have they been? What, uh, have they been exposed to? What does their x-ray look like, uh, in order to make tough decisions about where to send them? So, my hospital system, for example, has designated three hospitals, which they call hero hospitals. Mm -hmm. And for COVID sus uh, suspected patients, um, we're really cohorting them in these hospitals to prevent exposure um, to other patients and, um, and to the staff of various hospitals. And that's another way that we protect our PPE, our, our protection equipment, mm -hmm. personal protection equipment. Um, but uh, overall, you know, um, we, we're really doing an amazing job as a country of coming together and working together uh, to, to make these things happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's really a grand effort. Um, and we really mean it when we say that we have to do it as a collective, you know, whether you're healthcare related or not, because everyone has... Um, the direct influence in the and the indirect influence to be able to affect one another, you know, and we can see how it's a very different thing. You know, I was just on a call, you know, in a previous episode where, you know, uh, another physician was recounting her uh, experiences with Katrina 
and how she needed to go down there through a, you know, a, a medical mission, you know, to be able to help out. And natural disasters are different. You know, you can see the damages, you can see a natural event, whether it's a tsunami or a hurricane or a tornado um, or even war, right? Like you can see, you know, they're tangible, um, they're very in your face, but this is a very different entity because, you know, we're dealing with something invisible. And, you know, for better or worse, you know, our country has been a lot slower and a lot ill prepared for this. And, you know, because we're also 50 states, you know, we operate at a different pace. And so um, it, we could have ramped this up a lot earlier. And uh, but I do agree with you. We're doing a collective, you know, you know, doing this a lot faster. We're trying to get ventilators out there and even something as small as. You know, a, a lot of communities are trying to sew their own mask and donate food and, you know, bring things to the emergency room. I don't I don't know if your husband has mentioned anything from the community who've tried to, like, donate stuff. Do, does he mention anything like that to you? Luckily, he works in a, a smaller ER, a freestanding emergency room, and they have enough equipment. But my larger hospital system has set up donation um, places in front of the ent- the patient entrances where people can come and donate masks and, and, and other things uh, for us. So, but, and, and I agree with you that we are 50 different states and, um, you know, we're used to our autonomy uh, and <laughs> in terms of decision-making and where to, how much to restrict our citizens and their freedoms. And, I think it's it can lead to some delays, um, certainly, and also a lot of breakdown in communication. So the resources can exist and not reach places efficiently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, So uh, being as a you know pediatrician, um, you know you get to work with children and you know families directly um, or indirectly. You know. you know, I don't know if uh, you're doing a little bit more tele, uh, telemedicine now um, or you're still operating the urgent care as is. But what are you seeing now in terms of like, you know, how families are reacting to this? Um, are they coming more together? Are they, you know, uh, panicking more? Because, you know, because you can see differences from individuals who are being isolated themselves uh, versus families. Right. Like what are you seeing from your end um, working as a pediatrician? Sure. Well, I think for the, our, our families with children, when, for example, a, a child um, comes down with a sniffle and see it's allergy season, unfortunately. So uh, kids are still going to get sniffles and, and allergy responses. And um, parents are so concerned because they don't know how to triage these symptoms. Is this just a normal cold? Is this allergies or is this coronavirus? And um, so what I, what I am doing at my clinic is I am uh, operating via telehealth and doing a lot of things over the phone. Um, and also I'm triaging patients and their complaints over the phone and then having one family come in at a time so that there's no busy waiting rooms and I can clean in between patients in between rooms. And so, for example, if you if you fell and you need an x-ray for your wrist, then I can triage that differently than if you are coming in with um, severe coughing and fever. In terms of um, panic, um, there's there's certainly a heightened level of concern, Um, especially families will sit together and ruminate and start. um, I'll have a lot of parents who will say, I, I feel calm about this, but all of my family members are really getting on to me about mm-hmm. my my child's cold. And so I, I feel like I should do something mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, I think some parents are feeling a lot of pressure from family members or, or other friends to go get tested. Um, and and so they're calling me for my expert opinion on whether or not what how much they should panic. And um you know, it, it, when you're people, little people, um, you, it does turn your focus away from yourself. Um, you get to you get to focus on the the people you have to take care of, and 
um, at the, that can be a good thing and a bad thing, um, certainly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of, uh, you know, in, in terms of how, how my families have been um, doing, a lot of folks have done remarkably well with connecting with each other. So mm. there's definitely staying in touch. Um, this is the time when electronics are welcome. You know, we're always telling kids to get off of electronics, but we're actually using them more now to ha help our kids text their friends and, of course, do online schooling. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even enjoying the humor that's on Facebook um, in terms of memes and, and then spending time with, with each other um, has been, I think, hands down. Um, a lot of folks have definitely said, I, I'm really enjoying the time with my kids. Yeah, yeah. I would say to add your point, you know, families, you know, obviously there's no set quantity or set uh, makeup of the family. You know, some of them are you know, the nuclear unit, you know, mom and dad and, you know, two kids versus, you know, you have foster families versus, you know, you have families that live with their grandparents and aunts and uncles. So I can imagine, you know, that heightened concern where you're living with elderly, you know, family members where their immune system or their health may not be as strong. Um, but, I think in general, um, and you know, we've been talking about on the series is where this is the best time to slow down, um, you know, relax, calm down, practice really good stress management and coping techniques, um, you know, that we're going to get into a little bit more um, because stress, as we've you know talked about it before, it's stress is you know one of our main hormones. Cortisol, you know, can affect our hum, uh, Im immune system, and that can negatively affect it for long periods of time. Um, I am curious, and I'm sure a lot of people, other people, are curious, is that we've been hearing reports that you know children, younger people, um, yeah, I would probably say like young adults, adolescents, and and kids. Um, tend to be not as affected, or maybe that has changed over time, um, as we have been seeing through, you know, adults and elderly. Is there any special um, reason for this um, that you find um, from your um, experience? So I have been doing a, a quite a bit of reading on it, and the jury is still very much out. Uh, it, right now, no one is putting their name to um, anything specific there there are theories the theories are that the children's immune system is different um, in some ways stronger um, and in some ways simply different from that of of older people and um, and and so the virus may not be able to take hold and replicate as rapidly mm -hmm. and and so when kids if kids are getting it they're only very mildly symptomatic, and it, it may have a lot to do with with their their particular immune system being so different. They also don't have as many comorbidities or like underlying conditions, diabetes, heart conditions, and that may be another reason mm -hmm. why they've been so resilient. And um, not to jinx it, <laughs> but mm -hmm. they've been quite resilient through this pandemic. But uh, I think a lot of research is still going to go into that because um, the scientists really aren't willing to uh, to say that this is definitely the, what the reason they they're, they're th still still theorizing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Hey guys, we're going to be taking a short break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Thrive Bites. Let's get back to the interview. So I would love for the audience to kind of hear about, you know, your other side, um, you know, expertise. And uh, you are um, a heartfulness meditation trainer. And uh, you've done a lot of, you know, sweat equity into this. <laughs> yes. You know, you've definitely, you, uh, you've... Uh, practice since 2003. Uh, you've been certified since 2015. And you do a lot of work with this in terms of like we were talking about in the beginning, creating a conference, a continuing med medical education uh, seminar for healthcare professionals. And, uh, you know, just to kind of further uh, them, right? 
why was this important to you to um, do? And how do you think this will be useful and beneficial to, um, you know, people who could utilize it right now? Sure. Well, when I started meditating, I think it was, I was a resident at that time. And, um, but the longing for a spiritual practice had been in me since I was a lot younger. And during residency, it was such a stressful time in my life that I found meditation to be a great outlet for my stress and anxiety over the rigor of medical training. So now it's been almost 20 years. Uh, I mean, yeah, 17, 18 years that I've been practicing meditation. It really gives you a sense of your core values and continually brings you back to them. So that no matter what happens in your external life, all the changes, and I've been through a lot over the last two decades, um, th the practice keeps me centered and it keeps my cortisol levels low. So my inflammatory markers are low. I still sleep very well. And it gives you an overall perspective about the values in life that are just they supersede all the external drama. Yeah, because I think it's uh, very, very useful nowadays, you know, to be able to participate in something like that, um, whether it's meditation, whether it's yoga, whether it's mindful breathing, um, or just mindfulness in terms of connecting with one another. You know, we've had a lot of uh, different experts come on the series to kind of t talk about it. Um, you know, with you, you know, you have a very special population that you serve in terms of children and families. Um, how would you recommend, um, you know, families, uh, parents, um, or maybe even children? Because I don't think children need to be exempt from this. But what would you recommend them, you know, in terms of like basic steps in starting um, or setting up some sort of practice, you know, on their own? Sure. So, we under 15 recommend um, heartfulness relaxation, which is a, a very specific exercise that I can tell you about in a minute. And then over 15, we recommend heartfulness meditation. So on a basic level, uh, like the physical level, what I recommend for just good wellness care is having a good routine for kids. Uh, set bedtimes, set times to wake up, set meal times. That rhythm is very important to, to kids. And the predictability that things are going to happen at certain times and uh, that we're going to transition from one activity to another at a certain time, um, it really calms their anxiety. It, it keeps them flowing even um, through times where they don't have to go to school when, you know, when they all of a sudden were going to school and now not going to school, mm -hmm. uh, they can still maintain a good routine um, and, um, you know, still get fresh air, still exercise, um, still not snack excessively um, and have a good, healthy, balanced meals um, at set times. And then, in addition to that, it, for kids, we actually have a relaxation exercise that starts from our toes and goes all the way up to the head. And you simply bring your attention to each of your major body parts and relax them one by one. So if I were to guide you through one, it would start with your toes, go to your ankles, your lower legs, knees, hips, stomach, back, mm. shoulders, arms, um, all the way up to your face and scalp. And you would simply bring your attention to those things and, and say, you know, feel your arms relax, feel your chest relax, feel your shoulders melt away. And we do that for kids. And sometimes even the kids do it for their parents. Um, before bedtime or when they're starting to feel a little anxious. And between those two things, having a good routine and then relaxing well before bed, um, I think that that creates a really nice environment for kids to maintain good 
you know, well-being, overall well-being. And then for adults, we recommend a heart-based meditation, which starts with a supposition that there is a divine light within their heart. And they try to just maintain their attention on that divine light. Um, and as they see their thoughts come, they simply redirect their attention and try to maintain their focus on that divine light um, for about 30 minutes to an hour. And a certain transformation happens with that process, um, which which unfolds and they can observe that. Yeah, I think um, this makes me think about uh, when I was doing Vipassana uh, meditation. Um, back in 2012, I went to a retreat and um, it's a basically non-secular type of uh uh, technique that you do, and it teaches you to be just observant um, and equanimous um, with all the different sensations, you know, besides, you know, we're very visual nowadays, you know, we have screens all over the place, right? You know, your watch to your phone to your TV, yeah. everything, right? So we're very visually stimulated and very distractful at the same time. And sometimes we forget about, you know, our other senses. And this is why I love traveling. For those of you that, um, you know, follow my regular season podcasts, um, you know, I talk about travel a lot. And um, I love traveling because it helps me get out of my routine. And two, um, it lets me to engage all five senses. And sometimes we forget about that. So I like what you talked about in terms of visualizing different potty parts um, and just, you know, telling it to relax because, so, you know, we're sometimes we're not aware of how powerful our minds, you know, can be. So, um, and would you suggest the parents to do that with them or do the parents guide them along through this exercise? I think there's a, a power to the family unit doing this together, whether it's meditating together, praying together, doing a relaxation exercise together. Um, there's, it just creates a very special bond and a special uh, atmosphere. So I do encourage parents and children to do it together. They can do it by themselves. Um, but, but if the, if a parent guides the entire family through the relaxation, I think it, it's a very nice exercise. And, and then sometimes the kids want to want to lead the session. Do you have any recommendations in terms um, of mindful mindfulness in terms of breathing? Yes, absolutely. So, have you you you're probably familiar with pranayam? I actually have um, it's not. A, it's a, it's a, it's a breathing exercise. I'm sure you've run across it. Um, it it I, it's a it's simply breathing through one nostril and out the other, um, and 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 doing it you know with with sort of a gentle rhythm, um, five breaths in, five breaths out. Um, and you know, some people do it more rigorously with mm -hmm. as more of an exercise and other people do it at a more relaxed pace. Um, but, um, there's a lot of videos on, on that and you can follow along with someone to, to simply, um, ex, you know, inhale through one nostril and exhale through the other nostril and then switch. So, um, that's do that's you, one kind you of hold, exercise. Do you hold one one side while you're doing that? Yes, you press you press one side closed, and and you can. <laughs> I was sense about to say difference. that you you have to be really skilled to mentally close one side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you simply press one side of your nostril so that you're really breathing through one side, and then you press the other one and exhale through the other <laughs> side, and it it really. Um, you you'll notice that it's that it triggers things and it makes you feel different um, yeah. from just your regular breathing pattern. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 great for just you know strengthening your upper respiratory system. Yeah. And and there's people that are really good at it and can really um, strengthen their diaphragm mm -hmm. because they're doing it with such rigor. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I one exercise I think of is the four seven eight count um, by Dr. Andrew Wow out of uh, his Center for Integrative Medicine, and um, you know that one I really enjoy as well. Um, how uh, how do you how do you spell uh, that breathing exercise, and where can they find it? You said on YouTube. 
Yeah, so you can just type in pranayam, uh, P-R-A-N-A-Y-A-M-A. Okay, gotcha. Awesome. It's it, it's a, a quite a. Um, I mean, there's an extensive amount of of information on pranayam. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because it's um, sometimes we forget um, the number one thing, you know, whether it's bef whether it's coronavirus or something very, very stressful in our lives. And we tend to live in this baseline of fight or flight, you know, this heightened sympathetic nervous system response. And we're always on edge. Right. And one of the things that I find with my patients is that they forget to breathe. Um, and it's literally the first thing that we do when we are born, <laughs> it's literally the first thing. And mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we just forget about it. And I think exercises that you mentioned um, helps us to slow the breath because sometimes that's the, that's the immediate thing that is disrupted, but we're so engaged and so distracted by all everything outside of ourselves that we just don't, you know, remember to do that. Um, so I think it's, you know, very, very important. And I think it's an added um, bonus um, or challenge, uh, depending on how you want to look at it, for families to be able to do this with their family members. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, it, you know, when you have several family members chiming in, you learn a lot from each other uh, as well. And you learn a lot about each other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, this has been great. Um, in terms of just general, you know, you see, you know, you do pediatric wellness visits and, you know, and, you know, we always, you know, check out, you know, uh, kids and kiddos, you know, as they're growing up and all this stuff. Is there certain other wellness recommendations you would add in, um, in light of what we're going through right now? Um, and this could be in regards to lifestyle recommendations, diet or nutrition, um, because I, I think a lot of people are very, very focused on gut health and uh, immunity and building up that immune system. Um, maybe explain, you know, what it is to begin with, because I think a lot of uh, our listening audiences may not know what that is or where it's located. Um, and then just your general uh, wellness uh, uh, recommendations for that. Sure. Well, I'll tell you, I, at our last continuing medical education um, conference, I actually asked that entire room full of 40 doctors, um, okay, guys, tell me what you think will be the best diet. You know, the, if, I, if, if you had a wish list that your patients would use, pediatric or otherwise. Um, and I'll tell you, that even a room full of doctors gave you a very varied response. Mm -hmm. um, but with the, like, they, they all had a lot of different opinions about, um, gut health and, and what diet is optimal. Um, everyone could agree on plants, uh, on, on plant-based diets and in terms of fresh vegetables and, um, and fruits. Um, everyone could agree on, on obviously balancing nutrients, uh, getting enough hydration, um, really just hydrating a lot. And, and also most people could agree on not overeating. So really looking at how much and, you know, doing portion control and not for children, especially not associating food with rewards as a reward and not uh, uh, asking kids to finish everything on their plate. Because by doing that, you are overriding their natural appetite um, the one that says, okay, I'm done. And, and, um, when you force them to keep eating after they feel f full, um, they, then they, then they, the, the tendency to overeat begins mm -hmm. and also, um, not, uh, associating say your own emotional validation from how much they've eaten. I know like culturally, um, when I was growing up, if, you know, if I didn't eat a certain amount, it was as though I didn't like the food mm -hmm. and the person who made it would feel a little bit offended or, uh, oh, she didn't like it. That's why she didn't eat very much of it. And to take that emotional validation out of the food and just say, no, this is, you know, we're supposed to eat very limited quantities. Our, our stomachs are quite small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that room full of doctors could pretty much, those were the things we could agree on is 
fresh fruits, vegetables, um, balanced nutrition and uh, portion control. Hey guys, we're going to be taking a short break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Thrive Bites. Let's get back to the interview. Um, in terms of, you know, other supplements and, and all of that, the, the jury was, was still very much out and I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert on it, but perhaps you could, you could talk to us <laughs> about that because you're, you're, you're the chef doc. So I'd be interested in what you have to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the re the reason why we bring this up is because, you know, we had, we've had, uh, thankfully a lot of experts from different specialties kind of chime in. And, uh, you know, um, being from the pediatric side, I just wanted to, I was curious to see, was there anything different uh, during this event that, um, you know, could add in? But yeah, I definitely would love to reiterate, um, you know, for now, uh, families and, you know, general, what's interesting is that when this uh, pandemic first hit us, um, you know, a lot of things were being bought out. Obviously, the notorious toilet paper was gone. And uh, that is, you know, we all healthcare providers, we just all chuckle to ourselves. And we're just like, this is not a diarrheal disease. But okay, <laughs> or take all the toilet paper you want. Um, you know, let's all be selfish and just, you know, grab everything, you know. Um, and, uh, and I still can't find toilet paper. <laughs> it's still, yeah. And they're still limiting how many you can take yeah, from the store. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like one per customer. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a good thing. I'm a Costco member and I bought that gigantic, <laughs> you know, you know, carton full way back when I'm still using it over a year later. Um, but yeah, we talk a lot about, you know, gut health and immunity and, um, you know, for those in a listening audience, you know, the immune system is situated where it's, you know, two thirds, 70 percent is actually in your gut. Right. And so it has, you know, it's very influential to what you put in your mouths. And so like Dr. Ragini was saying, is that, you know, it's very important to have, you know, fresh vegetables, produce and fruits, which interestingly enough, um, was left behind in the supermarkets where everything else was bought I, out. <laughs> I, I, I thought I was the only one who noticed that because, yes, like. The, the peaches, there was ample <laughs> produce in, in the store. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, is that I, and I tell this and I agree with you, it's plant-based all the way because, you know, animal products, you know, I teach this to my patients before coronavirus, you know, animal products does not have vitamins and minerals and, you know, um, you know, fiber and the antioxidants, you know, and if it does, it's very, 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 very small amounts. Whereas ve fresh vegetables, even frozen and can, you know, have a lot of it. Right. Yep. And so, um, you know, what's interesting is that that's all left behind. So what are we talking about? We're talking about antioxidants, which help us fight inflama uh, inflammation and stress on our bodies. And, you know, um, you know, that comes in the form of vitamin C, vitamin E, um, zinc, you know, these are things that are found in, you know, our produce, right. And, um, you know, and I agree with you in terms of, you know, the whole hunger cues and not overeating because, you know, uh, their physical activity for kids, you know, and adults in general, we may not be able to have the opportunity to go outside as much, right? So you're not expending as much calories. So there is an opportunity to, you know, eat more and then possibly gain more weight. So, you know, I agree with you. Um, you know, we talked about in other episodes, um, probiotics, we've talked about fermented foods. So like kimchi or sauerkraut, um, for those of you that, you know, eat dairy, yogurt, uh, kefir, um, you know, uh, was mentioned in previous episodes. Um, so there's a lot of things uh, we can do to enhance um, our nutritional status. And you know what, you know, we just have to be innovative in terms of, you know, exercising more physical activity. Um, and this is where the families, you know, need to kind of rally together and um, do it with one another. And guess what, you know, your parents, you're going to be the eternal role models, and they're going to be looking up to you. So I think it's an added benefit to have your kids constantly look at you and be like, Mom and Dad, how come you're not moving around, you know, so, so working out together is super important. Wouldn't you uh, agree, Ragini? 
Absolutely. I, I think it's it, p- the ki- kids learn through osmosis and through all these nonverbal cues. You can talk to them and tell them to do things, but that's not nearly as effective as modeling the right behavior. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I love it. Um, and we're going to close out. Um, can you give us uh, any closing remarks, um, you know, just overall uh, with all this? And, um, you know, if people want to look you up or want to learn more about the Heartfulness Meditation uh, Organization, um, where can, you know, we find them? Sure. Well, my, I think to close out, thanks so much for having me. And I think during this time, we should consciously practice gratitude. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that we have, you know, to be grateful for, there's so much. And the fact that so many of us can very comfortably get through global pandemic is something to be very grateful for. The time that we have with our families, the slowing down of our pace of life gives us a good jolt and a good reminder to be grateful and um, you can um, use this time to reflect. A lot of people always told me, "Why well, I don't have time to meditate. And this is it. This is the time that we've been given. So use it wisely. Use it well. Use it for your internal reflection, for your exercise, for all the things that you put off when you were busy shuttling everyone around to school and shuttling p- kids to activities. Mm-hmm. Um, use that time to center yourself again. And you can find more about heartfulness meditation at www.heartfulness.org. Um, you can you can just, as far as I'm concerned, you can look me up on Facebook, um, and and you can uh, find me on the you can Google me and find my clinic. Um, and that's uh, I'll just spell out the the name here for you uh, for the website on and um, yeah. That's about it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I just want to let the listening audiences know that, um, you know, for those of you that are not, you know, able to join, this session will be recorded and published, um, you know, within the week um, or so. And uh, we'll include all the hyperlinks, you know, to Dr. Ragini um, and the Heartfulness uh, Meditation Organization. Um, and uh, just continue to uh, follow us. Um, Thank you so much for listening in, guys. Uh, thank you to Dr. Ragini calling from uh, Houston, Texas. And, you know, I really, really appreciate her energy and uh, lending her time to be able to help us continue to stay well um, and centered, you know, both physically and, you know, emotionally and mentally as well. Thank you so much, Ragini. Thank you, Colin. Have a great day. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening in, and uh, we will continue this COVID series. Please stay tuned. Be well and stay safe. Take care, everyone. Hey, guys, that was another episode of Thrive Bites. If you like that episode, please subscribe and follow weekly for new episodes. And don't forget to rate us on Apple Podcasts.